Susan, in trying to explain what we think is the mind, mm. there are many different brain theories by those people who believe that the, everything in the mind is somehow produced by the brain. Mm -hmm. What is your specific way, your mechanism of how the brain can create what we call the mind? So we have to distinguish between the mind and consciousness. Okay. But what we can do is having defined our terms, we can see how the one would impact on the other. Because when you go to sleep, you lose your consciousness. But very few people, when they go to sleep, think they're going to lose their mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Similarly, you can blow your mind or lose your mind, but you're still conscious. So I think these are valid, independent terms, although they will influence each other. Okay. The mind, I see as the personalization of the brain through the unique experiences that an individual has, which in turn will impact on the so-called plasticity of the nervous system. We know that the human brain adapts to the environment and therefore every experience you have will literally leave its mark mm -hmm. on your brain by strengthening or weakening or reshaping the brain cell connections that give you your unique take mm -hmm. on the world as mm -hmm. you see it. Mm -hmm. That is what I call the mind. Consciousness, my own view, is that it is correlated, and I know you might press me on causality, but... I cannot, and I'll put my hand up saying, you know, right. I'll give you your money back. Right. I, can't, I can't explain how one causes the other, but we start off by looking at how things match up, at correlations. My own view is that states of consciousness, that is to say, from when you're asleep to when you're awake, are correlated with what I call neuronal assemblies. Now, this is a technical sounding term. It's one that's used slightly differently by other scientists and other people describe the phenomenon I'm about to talk about with different words. So you know, again, everyone has their own way of explaining things. In my book, neuronal assemblies are large scale coalitions, let's say groupings of brain cells that are corralled up, that are recruited to work together in synchrony for less than a second and then they disband again. So a way I think of a neuronal assembly, and this is a metaphor, is think of a stone in a puddle. If you throw a stone in a puddle, it will have ripples. Mm -hmm. Now the stone is very small, the stone lasts forever, or quasi-permanent, and it's very small. But nonetheless, when you throw it, it will generate or trigger highly evanescent, highly transient ripples, the excursion of which vastly exceeds the size of the stone, but it's gone in a trice. Mm. We can, of course, vary the power to generate ripples. You can have a big stone. You can throw it very forcefully, or you can have competing stones that come afterwards that distort the ripples. Now, my own view is in the brain, these assemblies, these large-scale coalitions of brain cells are a bit like the ripples in the brain. And we can look in brain terms at how we can vary the size of the assembly. How many neurons, for example, would be in an assembly? Um, at least 10 million, 10 million, I would say. Okay. And I know this, let me give you an experiment from uh, the work of Amram Grimwald at the Weizmann Institute in, in Israel. I visited him in the mid nineties. I remember with this theory, which I was just then developing about the idea of a stone generating ripples and so on. And to my delight, he showed me his experiment. Now his experiment was in cats and it was looking at something called optical imaging. This is something you can't do in humans because it's invasive. It mm, means you sure. incubate brain tissue with a dye. The dye embeds in the cells so that when they become active, when their voltage changes, they, the wavelength of the dye will change. Mm. So you can look at the dye as a direct readout of the activity of the brain cells. This is called optical imaging with so-called voltage sensitive dyes. Anyway, he showed me the picture when he'd applied this technique to a cat and flashed a light and you could see, lo and behold, a, a, a point in the center and then an exponential decay uh, uh. Oh, which encompassed about 10 million neurons, which is why I give you that figure yeah. of 10 million Just neurons. Just so we, we can understand, yeah. 10 million neurons would be about how big in terms well, of physical size? Oh, well, a neuron is about 40 microns mm -hmm. across. So, um, yeah, something could measure several millimeters across right. easily. So, yeah, so, yeah. So, now, w would these be contiguous with each other or yes. can they be spread out over yeah. broad so areas? We work on this in my own laboratory and we've actually um, published on this if people want to sort of look this up, they can see them, yeah. Um, so what happens is it does look like a stone in a puddle. You have, if you color according to the activity of the brain cells, the different degrees of activity, you see different degrees of color, you'll see red as the hot spot and then going through mm -hmm. to, to purple. You can see that, yes, it does look like a kind of um, sphere or, or sort of an ellipse, a sort mm -hmm. of radius going out. So mm -hmm. it's like a stone in a puddle. Now you can vary the degree to which you can generate an assembly by lots of things. So let's go back to the stone in the puddle, because I think for people that's easier to think about. Um, how could you have a big stone or a little stone? 
what a big stone would be if there were lots and lots of neuronal connections, if something significant had happened to you. So if it was your mother coming in, she would have a significance because there's lots of associations in your brain that have been forged as opposed to any old lady coming mm -hmm. in. So that's how you do the size of the stone. What about the force of the stone? That would be the intensity of the stimulus. Now, it strikes me in its simplest form, this would explain why, very easy question, an alarm clock will wake you up. Why should an alarm clock wake, it wakes anyone up? You don't have to have a certain mm. culture or cognitive mindset. Right, right. Alarm clock will wake any person up. Why? Because the strong sound will recruit an assembly of brain cells. So it's a payoff between the intensity of the stimulus and the specific associations to you, that is the size of the stone mm. and the force with which the stone will determine. Mm. Then there's another factor that I think is very important because why should it corral up? Why should um, an alarm clock corral up lots and lots of brain cells? Why, why will this happen? Well, there's another feature that, again, I think is very important to brain function, and that is so-called modulators. Now, what do we mean by modulators in the brain? Why are they different from all other chemical messengers? A modulator is something that predisposes cells to respond as and when mm -hmm. a signal comes in. And these agents actually are like fountains in the brain. We know, and we've known for a long time, that deep down at the top of your spinal cord in your so-called brain stem, which is a very basic part of the brain, as you know, there are certain chemicals that are like fountains. And these chemicals, I'll name names, dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline, acetylcholine, these chemical messengers which people thought of just as ordinary transmitters, we now know can also act in a much more non-specific way. We know they're related to sleep-wake cycles. We know they're related to dream sleep cycles. We know that, for example, depression is targeted. Um, Prozac targets mainly serotonin. And what we know also is these group of chemicals can predispose cells to respond in a certain mm. way without <clears throat> themselves necessarily doing anything. It's very anything. generic. And very it, generic, it very widespread. Right. That's right. So they're like fountains. So you can imagine a following sequence of events. You're aroused, you're asleep, or you're in a certain level. This will determine the availability of these chemicals at any one moment. And the more they are present, the easier it will be when the alarm clock goes or um, when your mother comes in for that stone to mm. then trigger. Mm. So mm. I know this is all sounding rather <laughs> abstract, but so there's lots of factors that will determine at any one time the size of the assembly and hence your degree of consciousness. And let me just go through them again. The modulators that relate to arousal, sleep-wake cycles and general daily rhythms, uh, the intensity with which something is triggering and the significance of something. Mm. Um, then there's other facilitating okay. agents such as hormones and so on. Okay, so that that's consciousness per se. Now, what about the content of consciousness mm. and that... In the brain, we have electrical impulses that, if you look at them, they all yeah. look the same. Mm -hmm. They're all yeah. about a thousandth of a second yeah. and have the same yeah. chemical yeah. movements of ions across mm -hmm. membranes. And yet we have such different feelings about our senses. Mm -hmm. What it looks like mm -hmm. to see something is so different mm -hmm. than yeah. what it is yeah. to hear. And yet if you look in the brain in those areas, you see the same sure. electrical sure. impulses. Yeah, I think this is one of the most fascinating questions, the one that people seem to sort of sidestep. It's a bit like the alarm clock they sidestep. Mm -hmm. They sidestep this one. And yet if we could make advances on this, I think we would have some more insight. So let's just let me just rephrase what you said. What is really fascinating is subjectively, hearing and vision are completely different experiences. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know there's a few people who are so-called synesthetes, but mm -hmm. let's park them. For most of us, we know when we're hearing something, when we're seeing something, they're completely different experiences. And yet in brain terms, as you say, after transduction from the cochlea or the retina, the signal is transduced into volleys of action potentials that are pretty much the same and that follow the same fate in the brain, which is to say they're transmitted up through various substations to the outer layer of the brain, the cortex. Different areas. Yeah, different areas, but in cytoarchitectural terms, right, right. they're like cookie cutters. Yes. And we know that they are interchangeable because we know in blind people, for example, the so-called visual part of the cortex can be colonized mm -hmm. by the sense of touch and so mm -hmm. on. So we know that in brain terms, there ain't anything special about um, the process of hearing versus vision. Um, however, um, more recently, what we did in my lab was to analyze the assemblies and see what happened with the mm. assemblies mm -hmm. with hearing and vision. And we found after about 300 milliseconds, that's a third of a second, which actually is quite a long time, we could see a final difference in the pattern. And we were very excited by this. Now, but we then ran into a big problem. This is the problem. Just even if you can see differences in the brain with hearing and vision and how it might be processed, what do you do with that information 
in interpreting it in terms of the subjective experience of hearing and vision. And here's the problem. Whilst we can express in brain terms the assemblies generated in hearing and the assemblies generated mm -hmm. in vision along the same, same if you like, yardstick, we can say they're different, but they're different in a quantitative way. Hearing and vision, subjectively, how would you explain to a Martian the difference in hearing and vision? Mm -hmm. What common yardstick do we have for expressing what, it feels, what like. it feels like to have hearing, what it feels like to have vision. Now, there's one way I can think of, um, which sounds a little bit abstract, but here goes. Um, vision is primarily, but not exclusively, detection of differences in space. You're looking at edges. Hearing is primarily, but not exclusively, detection of differences in time. That's what hearing is, yeah? So Or pitch. Yes, yeah, or pitch. So could we not think of putting hearing and vision, if we want to put them on the same yardstick, on what physicists call a manifold of space-time. Space-time being something that I gather in physics is something that incorporates both space and time and is therefore perhaps a way of studying or mapping the differences we see physically in the brain onto this space-time manifold. Now, in order to do that, you need to know a little bit about relativity theory, which I know nothing about. <laughs> so if there's any physicists out there who'd be interested <laughs> in this, I'd like to hear from you because... I flounder, and this is an example of neuroscience or of, of, or of the study of consciousness generally, is that you bump up against your own incompetence. Mm -hmm. You know, you're only trained as an immunologist or as a neuroscientist or as a cognitive psychologist. And, you know, you're aware that there's a whole world of physics there that could be helpful yeah, or I, needed, I, I, but one can't... I could almost argue the there. opposite, that when, uh, when physicists who are mm -hmm. very uh, sophisticated in their area think they can then try to understand the brain, yeah. uh, they can run into trouble uh, sure. as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's going to get you anywhere uh, with a, a space-time manifold. I, I think there's something more fundamental in terms of what it feels like uh, between vision well, and... Uh, well, sorry, it depends what you're trying to do, of course. You yeah. know, if you're trying to approach the subjectivity of it all, then I think... One has to prove it. I have, a, I have a hunch, however, that time has something to do with it. Let me tell you why. Um, consciousness slows down in accidents, and it's slower in childhood um, when the stimulus coming in is very, very intense, when mm. you're being bombarded mm. with one thing after another and after another. And in older age, um, it slows down. And I have a hunch the subjectivity of time perception could in some way be linked to consciousness um, in ways that I can't articulate properly. And whilst you may say you're not sure if that's going to get us very far, again, um, I feel a little bit like with Christopher Columbus in Lisbon. You don't know till you've tried it. Yeah. <laughs>